Tracy, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's been a while. We worked together in Beijing for CGTN for about four years between 2013 and 2017. You've since turned apart from being an anchor into a blogger and YouTube uh, beauty influencer. Tell me more about the past couple of years, how you became to what you are today. Oh my god, that's such a crazy story because uh, I've always loved news, as you know, ever since I was a little girl. I'm very in tune with the news cycle. Um, but I also have a passion that is makeup and skincare. So I started about two and a half or three years ago. I started sharing a lot of skincare tips or makeup tips on the internet. I didn't expect it to become what it is today, but I'm very blessed to have, to have so many followers, make so many friends. I like literally you feel like you have a million friends on the internet you have a million friends like that feeling is incredible like to me to have the ability to speak to so many people on a weekly basis is so precious I feel so blessed I mean I don't know where this is gonna go but certainly I'm enjoying it as a side gig or hobby but it could it could become something so, so much bigger in the future so i'm really excited and uh the differences i really feel is that when i was a news anchor i was talking about something that's really far away from me like international relations uh, macro economy i mean those things matter matter to my personal life as well but it matters in a different capacity right now i'm talking about what are you going to use to moisturize your Face, like tonight or what are you going to do with the fine lines underneath your eye and those issues are very personal and very womanly in a way as well so I was able to talk to so many women and some men as well you, you touched them on a way more personal uh, basis and that feeling it's just wonderful to help people find great products to use to help people look more beautiful and feel more beautiful too I know. I was thinking you would ask the next question. That's awesome already. Well, um, Tracy, yeah. So China is the second largest beauty market in the world already after the United States. So how does a YouTuber like you actually monetize that business? Like how are you selling products? Uh, is it marketing? Is it live streaming sales events right now? How does uh, one make money okay China, you're absolutely right china's beauty market is ginormous according to a lot of forecasts uh the beauty market in china grow to almost nine billion dollars by 2024 is growing at about seven eight percent even during this time with everyone else the beauty market is on the decline still growing and i think the younger generation that's getting into putting makeup on their faces and learning about makeup tricks and trying a lot of attention things here products i want to say that i've always been pretty careful when it comes to like how to monetize through my platforms i want to first and foremost build a platform for people to enjoy my content and then for people to learn about useful tricks and getting useful information but one has many ways monetizing on your uh, influence or on your following over here primarily a lot of influencers would do a sponsored video videos just like the us right you do sponsor videos we work with a lot of multinational uh, beauty brands i've worked with estee lauder i've worked with uh, Shiseido. i've worked with a lot of really famous brands uh, over here in china and then you could obviously as you know youtube has this adsense uh, program where they pay you according to how many clicks you have on your on your content right so you get some money from that as well and i've also um started a uh, e-commerce platform selling usually not super multinational brands, but more localized, really effective, very niche market brands that really work. So I personally try out a ton of these products and then I carefully select what to sell in my store. And that's doing very well because I really enjoy experimenting with skincare, experimenting with makeup and trying to find the best products for um my fans, the people I really, really love. Tracy, uh, that's really interesting because uh, when I zoom into Weibo today, uh, you know, it's, it does uh, it speaks a lot to China turning into a 400 million consumer society today. But uh, you know, for me, I remember you know, when I was a young girl in my early twenties. I felt uncomfortable walking out of my house without having makeup. Okay, but now, like, today I have makeup. Fine. I spend five minutes doing my makeup, but if I don't have makeup, 
I'm perfectly okay going out. It's, what do you tell the young girls of this age? What is important to their lives? What value do you bring? Perhaps I will sh tell them as well that it's okay not to be beautiful because uh, beauty is indeed, as we say, isn't it? Well, so I, I don't think it's so much about it's not okay to be beautiful, but it's more okay to be beautiful in your own way, right? Like beauty could be defined in so many different ways. For me, I feel like makeup is not only making you more beautiful. You could view it that way. Um, I think personally, I look better with makeup, but some people look better without makeup and that happens as well. So the way I view it is that like makeup gives you the opportunity to be so many different versions of yourself. So even makeup, you can put really heavy makeup on. Like I do have all the time. I love that very dramatic, very drag queen like look. Like, you know, when I, when I was anchoring, a lot of times people would complain that you wear perhaps a little bit too much makeup and that that's okay with me because that's what I love. And I'm not saying that it's not good for everyone else. It's very personal. There's no right or wrong. I think it gives you the opportunity to be so many versions in terms of I could be really, really, you know, dramatic one day and I can be very light and airy on a different day and uh, also for the girls who think that you need makeup to go out in a public if you really feel that way then wear makeup just like people feel more comfortable wearing pants in the public some people feel more comfortable being naked in the public I think it's all okay as long as you don't break the law right <laughs> but I, I never want women to think that they desperately need makeup but I do want to talk to women who love makeup. and there's going to be women who are out there just never want to wear makeup and that's absolutely fine and there's going to be women who don't want to take care that's okay as well but there are I'm just reaching out to that group of women who love makeup as a passion uh, to look beautiful or look differently different kinds of beautiful every day and that's my targeted audience and if more people want to join that group um, who love makeup, then they're certainly welcome, but it's never forced upon anybody. And I also want to foster the type of thinking that, you know, you never need to fit in something. If you try that, ultimately you're going to be unhappy. Just open what your heart really tells you to do and what your heart really wants. And it's a very individual decision, right? And beauty yes. finally needs to come from inside. Uh, you carry the beauty inside of you and makeup is just like a final touch but there are also very very huge cultural differences so in China I remember uh, on uh, CCTV uh, the Chinese uh, state broadcast you know uh, some of the uh, lounges some of the makeup artists they basically give our faces like the Beijing opera mask um, and then outside of China here in Europe you know we want to have a more natural Makeup, how do you mix and match, and uh, what uh, do you like? Um, I love dramatic. I love the very sexy, you know, makeup blogger, beauty blogger look in North America. Pretty much the very American style, like very heavy dry right. makeup, dramatic fake eyelashes, and very glitter everywhere. If I could shower in glitter, I'd do it. Obviously, that's my personal style, and I know that a lot of people want to do that, but they are so afraid of getting judged especially over here in China. A lot of times women would think, oh, I really want to wear that green eyeshadow. But if I do wear it, will my peer judge me and think, oh, she's wearing too much makeup? What I'm trying to tell everybody is that it's very individualized. It's, it's a very personal decision. Obviously, if you are a doctor, sometimes you can't wear too much makeup because you're operating on patients, whatever. It could get in the way of your profession. But other than that, if your job, is okay with it or, is, or if you are on your personal time like you're on your break or whatever you're on weekends do what your heart wants and that just i can't emphasize that enough maybe because i'm really old now i just don't really care about anyone else's when i was younger i really i used to care about what my peers say what, what you know my, my neighbors might think what my friends might think these days i am the only person i need to please when it comes to how i want to look and i really do want a lot of young women out there to learn that your happiness will only come from being yourself and that's very important and so whatever you like you like a very airy light makeup you like heavy makeup you like no makeup you you want to look like a drag queen the lady boy or you know whoever you want and just do it whatever makes you happy and by the way, you're getting younger and younger and looking, you know, uh, younger 
like every year so i wonder what anti-aging products you're using and on top of that you've just had a baby so there must be some uh, beauty secrets that you could share with us thanks babe i'll send you some samples i've got some pretty good products <laughs> anyway, uh, the cultural difference you know it's really interesting because i happen to have uh, two girls uh you know my uh most precious uh, gift in my life and when they grew up they're teenage, they are like about 14, 15. You know, my children and all always the school mates, they all started with makeup. Which girls that have makeup in North America, you know, they started doing it at 14, 15. But uh, in China, we don't see a product that's designed for young girls, you know, at that age. And I think that market, sooner or later, you know, is it because Chinese girls don't do makeup that early? Or is it because just, uh, you know, the market hasn't really picked up on it yet? Because obviously, you know, with the rise of TikTok, they are the rising consumers out there. Yes, you're right. We don't see a lot of uh, 14, 15 year olds wearing makeup in China yet, primarily because I think Chinese schools don't allow uh, girls to wear makeup yet, whereas American schools, I started wearing makeup to go to school every day, starting age 13. So I, I got in it really early and I purchased a lot of really affordable makeup back then. And it was wonderful for me personally. I feel like if you are going to make a product for teenage girls, being clean, being green, being health conscious is very important. And it's, I've, I started to see a really good trend in China where a lot of companies really started paying attention to clean beauty and clean makeup. Take up, they take away a lot of harmful chemicals from these products. Um, they pay attention to being paraben free, phthalate free, sulfate free, fragrance free, all these products that could has had you know could have a potential to interfere with your hormone levels and all those products are being taken away from beauty products. Obviously my, my dermatologist told me that you know you use so little makeup it's not gonna have any effect on you. But I'm just saying it's to be a health punch when it comes to creating affordable makeup for kids girls is very important. I think plastic is something very prevalent very popular among teenage girls because they want their lips to look moisturized a little bit shiny okay for school and to have the cleanest most healthy um most health conscious formula for chapter for teenage girl is something that i'm personally very interested in of course you have to make the products affordable as well so you know the which uh, is really interesting because when my younger daughter turned 16 i was uh, chatting with martina yesterday so my birthday gift for her uh, at 16 was actually a, a beauty label because I realized that my daughter has been beauty for a couple of years, you know, they do get and a little girls and we shop at Sephora all the time. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of the products, they are not only for adults, but they don't fit their style. It's like a glitzy stuff. But also, mm -hmm. uh, they, have, uh, they are uh, acne prone, you know, they really need a lot of organic products. So there's really, you know, paying a lot of money, there's really not a lot of other things for them. And so, um, my daughter, which is important, the guy who teaches me a lot about values, is that uh, she said, I don't want animal testing in my products. So when we started mm -hmm. doing the label for her, she said, I don't want animal testing. And so I had to go out and uh, source it for the label that doesn't include the animal and the other thing is that she doesn't uh, of course she had a little bit of uh, she says she doesn't want to keep uh, chemicals in her so we had to do 100% organic products and in the end well, this is something that I get for my daughter I'll be her favorite of this life so, uh, this is oh, that's my daughter's name by her and Aphrodite oh, and by my years, for years and so that's what we use and but that every day it reminds me of all these values that are embodied in products. Uh, do Chinese, do you think of care of uh, animal testing is important? Well, so this is the situation. You know, China used to have a law that only allows products that are, are animal tested to come to China. So th that law was very controversial for a while, but the good news is the government really caught a clean beauty trend to a cruelty-free trend. I think they got rid of that provision. So these days, um, a lot of, you know, you know, like products without animal testing are coming to China. And this is a very good news because uh, a lot of younger generations really want products that are not being tested on bunnies. And this is a really lovely policy of in China. We're going to get greener and we're going to get more than So maybe even the big brands like the Body Shop uh, will see a comeback uh, in China. Well, these kind of green... Yeah. 
beauty products and organic and so on, vegan, uh, that's a big fashion trend as well. And a lot of Chinese KOLs and influencers like you are promoting that as well in the skincare uh, industry. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, these products, they use a lot of packaging and uh, plastic waste as well. So the balance is somehow still not there, right? Or do you see, you know, a greener trend coming as well when it comes to packaging and, uh, you know, plastic uh, zero kind of trend? Oh, for sure. We're seeing that in terms of um, a lot of beauty brands started selling refills. So instead of getting a new packaging every single time that you purchase a product, you get refills. Um, so that's a great trend. But at the end of the day, I think there's always going to be a struggle between growth versus being, you know, green and conservative and sustainable. People are saying, oh, you drive too much. Then what about the car manufacturers? And people say you fly too much. What about the plane makers and then also the fuel suppliers? And I think we're constantly trying to find ourselves in the struggle between economic growth and, and our protecting our environment. We really do have to find a balance because we can't just cut everything else. People still need to need to live and a lot of people's livelihood depending on these products being sold to people. Uh, I think that's a great start when we see companies started doing refills for their products and companies started using more recyclable material to make their packaging. And these things are all happening. I think in China might be catching up a little bit slower, but the consumers are slowly waking up to that trend and more and more people are paying more attention to the environment especially after this pandemic i think people realize how important health of our earth really is to us so that's a great trend to see tracy uh talk about a favorite topic of yours i see in your blog a couple of times email uh plastic surgery oh you love know, it oh, okay. what is acceptable to you what is that where's the red line to be honest, I, I there's nothing that I would like not do personally. Maybe not at this stage of my life, but I feel like everything is up to grab to me personally. And for other people, I'm never the one to, who tells people who, who tells people that you should or should not get something because I feel like plastic surgery or even just the medical skincare using needles, whatever. It's a very personal choice. I do, however, advise people, if you are going to do it, you have to thoroughly understand what you're doing and get to know the procedure, get to know your surgeon, get to know your doctor, get to know your dermatologist, and make informed decisions. However, I wouldn't try to convince people to make decisions one way or another, but just be informed. I feel like so many consumers worldwide sometimes they would jump into a procedure without knowing so much about without knowing the risk, without knowing what the procedures really are and as a blogger myself i would love to do something to help these people out i haven't done anything other years like surgery wise but i'm very in tune with the injections i i couldn't do it for a while i can't do it now i couldn't do it for i for a while, I was pregnant and I had my baby, so I'm breastfeeding, so I can't do my Botox, my fillers. But I do see results, and I think that I look good with them. They may, may argue otherwise, but I think it's a very personal decision. I love fuller lips. I've done it once. I didn't like the results, by the way, on my lips, but I've done Botox. Women should do whatever they want to do uh, without being afraid of feeling, um, getting judged or uh, feeling pressured. Do or not to do a certain thing. That's just my point of view. Right. There has been such an industry growth. I mean, when I left China, these the beauty <laughs> surgery centers, they started growing and mushrooming. And before, um, everybody took the plane to uh, South Korea, right? So, what's such oh, a yeah. cosmetic surgery hub. Um, but uh, talking about makeup again, one very famous uh, person is uh, China's uh, lipstick. King Li Jiaxi, who has made some 145 million US dollars in sales during the last uh, single stay. Do you see this um, as the future, you know, in terms of business model and will this be sustainable? Um, do you see a lot of millennials, the generation um, C and so on, jump into that kind of uh, business model as well and following in uh, Li Jiaxi's uh, footsteps? You mean the live broadcasting and selling products type model? Yes, uh, the live market for it. Whether it's going to grow as fast as it has been, I, I personally question. There are also people who question these numbers and the calculation. Maybe there's uh, some money 
kind of, I don't know personally, but whatever this man accomplished, Rijachi, I think it's marvelous. And this is a very remarkable young man, looks good, very articulate, very uh, eloquent. I personally watched a couple of his broadcasts and it does make me want to buy products. <laughs> I do see a lot of people want to get into that career, but I want to say that the barrier to entry is extraordinarily low. As long as you have the connection to the internet, as long as you can talk, you can sell products that way. However, just like acting, very few people could be very successful. So do keep that in mind. It is perhaps not a career, viable career or choice for everyone. But for the people who really are passionate about it, I say go for it. Why not? You never know. Do you do live streaming? Uh, not yet, but I have a plan on in the future. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I've never done it. So, for my, I've, I've been invited to do a lot of these broad, like live broadcasting, selling products type of uh, type of events. I haven't said yes to any of them yet, just because if I were to do it, I want my first appearance to be a huge success. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not very confident yet. So hopefully I'll have an opportunity to do it and hopefully I do very well as well. That's great. So uh, another subject for women, freezing the eggs has become very popular and especially for women in the late 30s, early 40s, you know, the quality of the eggs is with its age. To me, what if you meet uh, Mr. Wright sometime later in life and you wanted to have a nice child? So why is it so controversial in China? What is the debate? I think whenever a new idea or something relatively new comes to people's mind, it becomes controversial in a way that people don't like change inherently. No matter who you are. Inherently, none of us likes changes. I think it takes a while for people to accept any new ideas. Same thing with uh, individual fertilization. IVF, when it first came to the United States or it came to the United Kingdom where it was invented, People were rejecting the idea overwhelmingly. They were saying that, how could you play God? You know, life could only be given by God. How could you, a doctor playing with an egg and a sperm and make an embryo and create a baby? You can't do that. But look at where we are today. IVF is wildly, wildly accepted uh, across uh, the world, I think. And with egg freezing, I think it's, the idea is still relatively new over here in China. But I think, I think it's going to change very soon. With so many women... Wanting to do it, wanting to learn about it, wanting to fight for the right to do it. I personally, I am going to freeze my eggs. Even I'm married with a child, I would still do it. I'll, I'll tell you why. I always think <laughs> the reason why so many people discriminate women against our age. They do age discrimination. They are so ageist. Is because they really tie a woman's value to her ability to bear children. So your fertility is tied to your self-worth in a lot of times over here in China, whether you like it or not. It's not a situation that I like. So I'm married. I could have more children if I want to, but just thinking about my husband could be fertile till the day he dies, right? Men are fertile till the day they die. They make sperms constantly. It's never ending. And for me, maybe in 10 years time, not maybe, in 10 years' time, it probably is going to be really difficult for me to naturally conceive a child. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend my biological fertility and no one is going to stop me from doing it. Not because I want to have kids with other men. It's not because I want, you know, I have issues or anything. I just want to have the same kind of fertility span as a man. I think technology has told women, you know, this gift and we should do this. And it's all about our freedom and decision making power as women, right? It's all up to us so that you can just uh, expand the time span that is uh, available and time frame. So that is uh, all up to us. Well, let, me, let me just make it clear that I'm not saying that a woman's worth is tied to her fertility. By no way I'm saying that. I'm saying that some societies view it that way. Absolutely wrong. And the reason why I'm doing it is in a way to help a lot of societies change their minds. If women can no longer be bogged down by our pretty thoughts, maybe the, the people who are thinking that way will change their minds. That's why I, I will do it. And also, I feel like if I, go, if I go through it personally, I show what it takes to do, uh, what it takes financially and personally and physically to freeze your eggs. 
and there are all millions of women out there wondering how did this change for the stuff. So, and to me, fundamentally, it's not even the outcome of actually having a child. It is the, the definition of a choice. And I think human, like you said, we are involved with right choices and should yes. always embrace that woman to have that choice of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, physical fertility. I think that is fundamentally important. So I, I absolutely endorse you on that value. But also going back to your know, business, safety is also a choice. So for example, we talked about, you know, you can wear any many kinds of cups and, uh, you know, you know I, there are many you. But at the same time, I guess what is the most important thing that you want to in part to these young generation uh, about confidence building because ultimately whether you want to please your age, whether you choose to get married, whether you to conceive a child, whether it, you know any choices you want to um, choose a career, it's all about confidence, right? It's about who you think you are from the inside of you. How do you teach children that? Um I I can only speak for myself and how I would teach my daughter. People always say, I see a lot of uh, my followers say that I feel that I appear very confident. I don't think I'm like confident. confident. I guess I am, but not in a way that I think I'm great at everything. By no way. By no means. I'm great at everything. I fail at a lot of things. I have a lot of flaws. Uh, the reason I feel very confident is because I'm so self assured. I am comfortable with who I am. I think that with age as well. Perhaps I'm not old bloggers, I'm one of the older ones. <laughs> Don't tell us anyone, but that's um, Maybe it, it comes with age, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But if I were to tell my own daughter, I tell myself, explore your desires and accept your flaws. These are the things that I would tell her. So if you desire to wear a lot of makeup, you go do it. If you you desire to look sexy and wear revealing clothes, do it. If you desire to you know, cover up and be super religious. Do it. Do whatever your heart wants. Give in to your desires. That that's what I will tell her. Life is too short. Do what you want. Let your inner self out, and then accept who you are. If that's who you are, then accept it. If you think that you suck at something, try to change it. If you can't change it, accept it. And that's really personally, uh, I think the key to happiness. So for a younger generation of children, I want to say that not everybody can become Elon Musk. Not everybody can become Madame Curie. So not everybody can become Margaret Thatcher. So everybody plays a different role in a society. Ultimately, what we really want is that very elusive happiness. Don't care about other people. Other people have their own destinies, destinies to fulfill. Everybody is here to fulfill your own destiny. Make your life what you want it to be. Sometimes we get so lined up in comparing ourselves to others. Oh, am I richer? Am I prettier? Am I taller? Am I this or that? Forget all about that. Be who you are. And everybody is super unique anyways. And you have your own destiny. And shine in your own, in your own destiny. Uh, Tracy, yesterday, you know, some families took part in a beautiful life, which we don't you know. And so that just sets focus specifically on your talk, which is about desires and pleasure. For example, you know, you to change, you know, do what your heart feels like. You know, cannot drink as much as you want. I don't think that is right. It's, it can be expensive. You cannot drive as fast as you want it's just because you like it, because there is a speed limit. Mm -hmm. It's a mod level of moderation to everything. It's not just about pursuing pleasure, right? Ultimately, but the real happiness is just about seeking bodily pleasure. Well, this is the way I look at it. Obviously, facing your errors that are within the bounds of the law, you can't break the law. Law is law. If you are chasing your desire at the expense of hurting other people, then you're fully wrong. Uh, what I'm saying is that you can chase your desires, you can give in your desires as long as you are other people and you don't break the law. And these are the two prerequisites when it comes to building uh, your desires. Uh, I'm more talking about, if you want to wear a low-cut low shirt today and show some people to do it, 
If you want to wear a short skirt, do it. If you want to wear super high heels, do it. If you want to dye your hair, do it. It's that type of thing. Not so much as I want to kill somebody. So I do it. <laughs> you know? Um, so, so that's what I meant when I said giving to your desire. Some people desire to be, to look a certain way and maybe they don't feel like that's widely accepted by the society. Let's say get a lot of tattoos over here in China. A lot of times you get judged. But I say, if that's what your heart really wants, then do it. Just make sure that you're old enough to make sound decisions. And obviously every parent will tell their own child, their own you know theory. And I am the same way. And uh, it's going to be hard to strike, is to strike a balance sometimes between your true desire and what you want to and self-control, right? Everybody has to practice a little bit of self-control. I do believe that people have the intelligence and a capability to make uh, rational decisions and to draw the line between where I can give in to my desires and, and also like where I can do this without harming anybody or break the law. Great, Tracy. I think, you know, we've covered like the whole world of beauty and society and women issues. Thank you so much for your time. It was amazing to see you again. And I don't know why you look younger every time I see you, but you do naturally as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Tracy.